this candle as a symbol of Christ, the light of the world, in our midst. It provides us with inspiration and illumination throughout our worship service as a reminder. And when it is extinguished at the end of the service, we remember how Jesus said, You are the light of the world. And uh, we take that light and go out from this place uh, into the world with it. I welcome you today. Good morning. Good morning. This is Bloom in the Desert Ministries, United Church of Christ, where we strive to live up to the motto of the United Church of Christ that says, whoever you are and wherever you are on the journey of faith, you are welcome here. And so we um, are intentional about stating that we welcome people who come from a wide variety of backgrounds and in this particular location, being Palm Springs and a destination city, uh, people come from a wide variety of geographical references. We know that people have many different statuses in life. We welcome all. We know that uh, there are people who are straight and gay, bisexual, transgender. And in the realm of transgender, we know that life is not a binary world, but a continuum or a spectrum. So therefore, we know there are people who are transitioning, people who are gender fluid. We basically strive to welcome people as you see yourself from the inside out rather than an identity that we would strive to foist upon you. We also know that we welcome people who are all a part of God's creation around the globe, and we welcome people who are black and white and red and yellow and brown. And that's the way that we strive to uh, live up to the other motto of the UCC that says that all may be one. So now is a time when we transition from being out there to being in here, from being scattered to being gathered. As people have done for eons, we bring our heart and soul and mind and strength into this place for the worship of God and hearing of the Word. So let us do that now as Malcolm... This is the time in our worship when, in faith, we open our hearts to ministry. It's a litany for all who labor. In a call and response, let us pray for the hands that care for us and the hearts that love us. We are grateful. For the gardeners and farmers who help the earth bring forth food. We are grateful. For the cleaners who care for our homes and teachers who care for our children. We are grateful for workers who provide us for us and who toil to take care of our needs. We are grateful for civil servants and leaders who serve our communities. We are grateful for those who labor, for those who work, for those who toil. We are grateful. In our gratitude, we pray for their strength, their health, and their well-being. Help our prayers become peace. So our gratitude bears the fruit of action, generosity, and justice for all. Eternal source of life and love, receive now our silent meditation and prayers. All our silent prayers, let the people say Amen. 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 Rich or poor, young or old, we share one thing in common. God is creator of us all. Amen. Amen. Let us now receive the word. Hebrew scripture is from one of that group of books which we find in our Bible, located between those books of history which we've been reading from quite a bit, and the greater later books which will be called Prophets. And these are called this particular book is called Proverbs. It was one of my mother's favorites. She quoted many Proverbs to me as a child. And uh, most of the Proverbs are attributed to Solomon. Whether he actually wrote all of them may be a question. They are mostly short and of uh, interest to us. Now today's Three Proverbs come from chapter 22, verses 1 through 2, 8 through 9, 
and 22 to 23. A good name is better than great wealth, the esteem of others than gold and silver. The wealthy and the poor share a common bond. Yahweh is the creator of us all. Calamity is the fruit of iniquity. The reign of terror self-destructs. A blessing comes to the generous. They can give a bounty to the poor. Don't cheat the poor and take advantage of their poverty or imitate the needy in court. For Yahweh will defend their cause, oppressing those who oppress them. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading from the book of Proverbs. I studied very hard this week for this gospel reading. So um, there was a group of us who talked about exactly what the message was. And I hope I'm able to express myself in the right places so that we can all understand this message. The gospel reading today comes to us from the book of Mark. Can you could please rise? The book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. Jesus left Genesaret and went to the territory of Tyre and Sidon. There he went into a certain house and wanted no one to recognize him, but he could not pass unrecognized. A woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him. She approached Jesus and fell at his feet. The woman who was Greek, a Syrophoenician, by birth begged Jesus to expel the demon from her daughter. He told her, let the children of the household satisfy themselves at the table first. It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, yes, Rabbi, but even the dogs under the table eat the family scraps. Then Jesus said to her, for saying this, you may go home happy. The demon has left your daughter. And when she got home, she found her daughter in bed and the demon gone. Jesus left the region of Tyre and returned by way of Kiritz, Sidon, to the Sea of Galilee, into the district of the Ten Cities. Some people brought an individual who was deaf and had a speech impediment and begged Jesus to lay hands on that person. Jesus took the one who was afflicted away from the crowd, put his fingers into the deaf ears, and spitting, touched the mute tongue with his saliva. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said, Ebatha, that is, be opened. At once the deaf ears were opened and the impediment cured. The one who had been healed began to speak plainly. Then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone. But the more he ordered them not to tell, the more they proclaimed it. Their amazement went beyond all bounds. He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Here ends the reading of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. I think Marilyn did a really fine job with all of those hard names to pronounce and <laughs> that sort of thing that was in included. And I will uh, testify to the fact <clears throat> of her own self-study and working on that. She wrote to me and asked me to um, send her phonetic 
uh, pronunciations of all those words and being a believer in teaching someone to fish rather than fishing for them. Uh, good, uh, good, anyway. Uh, I, I sent her a pronunciation guide and uh, an audio one and she could look up the words and find those and do that. So, you know, uh, I, I, you fished very well, Marilyn. And, 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 and we're all grateful for that. My concentration is on the first part of that reading. If anybody goes home and wants to read that whole reading, uh, one of the little key phrases that is used about that reading is that it conveys what is understood in Mark to be the messianic secret. And there's often, you know, when Jesus says, don't tell anyone uh, about it. And, you know, yeah, I did this, but don't tell anyone. And, and there have been debates and studies and whatever, you know, for whatever for years about why there is this messianic secret. And there's a lot of theories about it, but we're not going into those today. But you're certainly welcome. You do a Wikipedia search for messianic secret and see what you come up with. Put that into the Google machine and, uh, and, and see what happens. My focus is on the encounter that occurred with the Syrophoenician woman uh, today. Let's pray. Bless us, loving God, as we are continuing in worship. We are grateful to be here. We know that this is a completely unique moment in time. It'll never be this way exactly again, and it's never been this way ever before. So help us appreciate the brilliance and the gifts that are with us in this moment of opportunity. And help us also know and remind us by your nudging that your spirit is with us in all times, in all ways, always helping us to move forward in life and helping us to hear your word among all of the words that we experience in a time like this. As the psalmist prayed many years ago, we pray now that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth are acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. It is good sometimes to change your mind. I know that many of us have headstrong ideas. And these ideas are about certain things, and sometimes, but not always, those include concepts of faith that we hold dear. Now, my intention in ministerial leadership is never to ruin anybody's faith. And yet I think that we are creatures with the capacity to learn and grow in faith all throughout our lives. The old saying goes, you learn something every day. But my training in college as a teacher, undergraduate studies, taught me that no one ever learns anything unless they are willing and ready. What I truly hope for is that we realize that when we are together, that in addition to the affirmation and support and healing that we may experience as we are in worship and serving together, we also sense that it is good for us to learn and grow in education and experience as well. It seems to me that when we leave our encounters with one another in the same condition as the moment we started, then we are somehow stuck. Instead of being the same, I hope we would leave encounters with one another feeling loved and blessed, perhaps a little bit more whole, maybe relieved, maybe affirmed, maybe forgiven, maybe reconciled, and maybe some way I cannot think to describe, but always good and certainly a little better. I believe and think that our Christian faith has an inherent energy that is trying to help people get unstuck. Now let's see how the encounter between a commonplace foreign woman and Jesus led to some unsticking in our story today. And maybe it will help us in our lives as well. One scholar says that this is the only Bible episode that shows Jesus changing his mind. I am not certain of that. 
simply because I do not claim to be a Jesus expert and I can't claim that myself as firmly as I think some other people I know could. Maybe it is the only time that Jesus changed his mind in this dramatic way. But I also remember the story where Jesus at first tells his mother that he was not ready or willing to do any miracles at the wedding. And then he did. What I can say is we need to remember that when these Bible books were written, there was tension in the early church about whether a person had to be Jewish in order to be a Christian. In fact, they had to be Jewish in order to be a Christian. In the early days, the followers of Jesus were Jews who thought they were taking their faith tradition to completion, not changing it to make it something different. Consequently, the earliest disciple thinking was stuck with the assumption that Jesus' mission was exclusively for the Jews, who were the inheritors of the traditions of Moses and David and Solomon and the prophets. But in that first century day and age, a Gentile woman, a foreign woman nonetheless, who was Syrian like the migrants crossing European borders today, and on top of it all, a woman in the back then very man's world refused to be squelched and in being what some would embrace as uppity, this woman's story is meant to unstick exclusionary thinking. In the story, Jesus called her people dogs. To know this language in context is to know that this was not about beloved pets. This was an insult. There's study about what that actually meant, and you can find a range of thinking, but it was pretty much understood that uh, there were few dogs that were pets in the beloved way that we have now. This was an insult. The Gospel writer Mark includes this in the story for a reason. It shows how far the ancient thinking has to go but it is not so far off from our own. This woman was a foreigner. Today we do not call foreigners dogs as a common insult. We call them murderers and rapists. We call them potential terrorists. We call them disease carriers and job seekers, job stealers, regardless of whether they're job seekers or not. Under the pen of Mark, Jesus was only saying the words of the people. But the Syrophoenician woman performed a miracle upon the one we call miracle worker. She turned his insult into a reason for helping her, according to Mark's gospel story. Because in Mark's gospel story, from that point on, Jesus, after this experience, broadened his outreach to include the Gentile world. She changed his mind. As I mentioned last week, this is how the Apostle Paul was writing in the same decades, and it caused Paul a lot of grief in and of itself. But we do not have time for more of that talk today. This is an intentional mind change in Mark's story that we can always use to unstick our thinking and know that open and affirming ministry is firmly established and justified in the Christian story. To this day, open and affirming ministry dovetails with our mission as people and as church, while the Holy Spirit continues to fire our imaginations and intentions for being the people of God in Christ's name. It was good that Mark's Jesus changed his mind. It was good for the foreign woman, and it remains good for us. It will be good for us always in our encounters with people, as individuals, as groups like church, and as nations. 
Because of who we are committed to follow, we have the potential to dispel preconceived notions, even long-standing rivalries and difficulties, if we know that love and grace are meant for everyone. And everyone can be given a chance for healing and happiness. One of the preacher advisors online, I, you know, look at a lot of resources. One of the people, I study hard, like Marilyn, getting ready for times like this. One of the preacher advisors online wrote that all of us in pulpits ought to look for the Syrophoenician woman in the back row of the church this Sunday. Maybe she's the one whose reputation discourages her from getting involved or the one who slips out during the last hymn in order to avoid having to mix with the churchy people, the insiders. But she keeps coming back, fiercely convinced that if anything you, anything I, anything we preach, week in and week out is true, then it's got to be true for her too. To this I would add for all of us to look for the Syrophoenician woman anywhere people are treated worse than we treat our dogs. Look for the Syrophoenician woman anywhere disadvantaged persons are reaching out to grab the opportunities that typically pass them by. Look for the Syrophoenician woman anywhere you find another human being and know that as followers of Jesus, we can, with attention and kindness and the resources we carry in our pockets, break loose all the sticking points that hold people down and turn them away. In his usual dose of common sense, Mark Twain wrote this prediction. Twenty years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things you did. Jesus changed his mind in response to the woman's fervent request. He did good rather than stand righteously over someone who was thought to be bad. This is the model of our faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we present now what we have brought to you, things that are both visible and invisible. The coins and paper represent our work and express in a clear and visible way our love and thanks. But we also bring as an offering the fragile dreams and hopes that we have. These invisible gifts are what sustain our lives. Receive all that we have brought in love, O oh God. Amen. Amen. We offer this money, God, not just to keep our church going, not even only to do your work in the world. We offer these gifts primarily as a sign of our gratitude for life, and as a symbol of our willingness to give our lives to you. Receive us, God. Put us to work and to love. In your name, amen. Amen. Thanksgiving. God is with you. And also, and also with you. Let us lift our hearts. We lift them to our God. Let us give thanks and praise. Is this is a good and joyful thing to do. It is a right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give you praise, all of you, God, creator of energy and matter of heaven and earth. Long ago, we renewed your rainbow covenant with every living creature by entering our realm in the person of Jesus. He gave us your unconditional love on this mandate. I give you a new commandment, a love of one another, and here to love one another the way I have loved you. This is how all will know that you are my disciples, that you truly love one another. Therefore we celebrate you, joining our voices with the wind and the streams, the animals and flowers, the living and the dead, the stars and the planets, and all the company of creation. 
who forever sing their unending hymn to proclaim your glory. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are all who come in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. We remember that on the night before Jesus was betrayed by one whom he loved, and killed by ones who feared him, he sat at table with his friends, women and men and children, sharing the feast of the Passover, which is the celebration of the liberation of God's people. Remembering God's power, Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks and blessed it, he broke it, saying, This is my work and my life for you and with you. Take it all of you. After dinner, Jesus took the Elijah cup, the cup that was traditionally reserved for the Holy One to come. But instead of waiting, Jesus passed it to them as it is now being passed on to us, and he said, This is the cup of the covenant. It is the cup of justice and peace poured out for all. Drink of all of you and do and this in memory of me. me. Each time that we break bread together, we participate in the body of the risen Christ, for we are the body of the risen Christ. And each time we share this cup, we participate in the new community, for we are God's hope for the new community. For this, we ask your blessings. Pour out your spirit on us, upon these gifts of grain and grape, that in the sharing we recognize Christ in our midst. This offering of praise and thanksgiving is an offering of us to you. Hasten the day when the prophet's dreams come to pass, when justice falls down like bars, and nations no longer threaten each other, neither shall learn more anymore. This is we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And pray together the prayer given to us from Jesus, using the words most familiar and comforting to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The nine, the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 